Hitler knows it isn't easy when I seek you I love you more it's a lesson you've tried to teach me you've shown the same truth times before you never gave up though I was careless you knew one day the time would come I rest in your goodness, wait for your kindness, I hope and I trust in your promises, Lord, I hope and I trust in your promises. understand your truths by seeking out your words by seeking you you never gave up though i was careless you knew one day the time would come when i would need you more than ever you've always been in love afford you our patience endless perfection Comfort of comforts, priceless reward. I rest in your goodness, wait for your kindness. I hope and I trust in your promises, Lord. I hope and I trust in your promises. I celebrate the times you work within my life. You conform my mind to your truth. It's an endless road, but I have this hope. I am not alone. I'm with you. And Lord, you are patience, endless perfection, comfort of comfort, priceless reward. I rest in your goodness, wait for your kindness. I hope and I trust in your promises, Lord. I hope and I trust in your promises, Lord. I hope and I trust in your promises, Jonah, we go over there Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to be reading the entire first chapter if you want to kind of start heading over that way. Uh, kind of an obvious title to the message today. Basically, you can run, but you can't hide. Or, the prison of God's perseverance. Jonah 1, 1 through 17. Well, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Jonah, I'm sorry. If you want to please... Jonah 1, 1 through 17. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish for the, from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea.
to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea is wrought, and was tempestuous. They said unto them, Take me, he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea was wrought, and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture and the message that it gives to us. The idea that you are everywhere and that you will have your way with your people. And I pray that we would know that today. I pray that we would learn the lesson that you have for us, Father, that, so that we know that we're the safest when we're closest to you. So I pray, Father, that hearts would be touched this, this morning. If there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today might be the day of their salvation, that they might accept Jesus Christ into their hearts. And above all, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified here today. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Please be seated. So during the awful, bloody days of World War I, there was a British soldier. You might say he got a little bit shell-shocked. He'd been in the trenches a long time. He'd seen far too much for his young 20 years. He'd seen a lot of death. He'd seen a lot of suffering. Blood everywhere. He got to the point where he couldn't take it anymore. We call it PTSD these days. But he decided to run. And so what he did was that night he escaped. And he tried to find his way to the coast. He tried to find his way there so that he could catch a boat and make his, his way back secretly to his homeland in England. In the darkness of the night, he got lost. He was pitch black out. And he stumbled upon what he thought was a roadside. And so he figured, well... I might as well climb up to the top and see if I can read this thing. So he starts shimmying up the pole. And he comes to a cross member and he hooks his arm around it. And he says, all right, I'm going to go ahead and light a match. And I will see what the sign says. And maybe then I'll be able to know where I am. He lights the match and staring at him is an image of the face of Christ. See, he had climbed up an outdoor crucifix. A lot of those things in uh, churches in France. You'll see these around various churches. But he climbed up there and he saw this, what he determined to be an image or a face of Christ. And it stunned him. It stunned him. It woke him up. Yes, we would say, okay, it's an idol. But to him that night, that was the face of Christ looking at him, showing him his own guilt. You see, Christ never ran from his troubles. When, when it came his way, he accepted his Father's will and he did it. This message seemed to get through to this young man. And as he climbed down, he determined 
and he would go back to his unit, and the next morning, he was fighting alongside his comrades in the trenches once again. I say that to say this. God has an amazing way, and a unique way for all of us, all of the time, to get our attention. Whatever it takes, he will put in front of you in order to wake you up. In order to snap you out of your doldrums, whatever you're thinking about, he will find a way to get your attention. When he calls us to do something, and we draw back from him to go our own way, this becomes necessary. See, when that happens, the Lord pursues us until we turn back to his plan. When the Lord has an assignment for you or a job for you, he's already determined that it's you that's going to carry it out. You may run a whole lifetime, but he's going to pursue you. You see, it's non-negotiable. When God has something for you to do, you do it. Did you ever notice when you come up against a problem and you avoid it or you go around it, it always manages to show itself again somewhere in your life. You're in the exact same situation because we haven't dealt with it the first time. You can't grow in Christ unless you learn the lessons that He wants you to learn. So you've got to go through the trial. You've got to go through whatever the thing is that God places in front of you. He wants to show Himself sufficient. He wants to show Himself strong in your weakness so that He can be glorified. He brings you to the place where you can, where He can use you for a task that only you can do. He'll do whatever He needs to do to get your attention and to bring you to a place where you're willing to do what He tells you to do. This is one of the lessons in the book of John. It's probably the central one for today, though. God called him to a task, and he didn't want to do it, and he ran from it, but God persevered. And he sent Jonah into a prison experience, if you will, to get his attention and to gain his cooperation. He wants Jonah to buy into what he's doing. So the prison was not constructed of brick and mortar and metal bars. It was constructed of flesh and blood and ivory. It was, in fact, a fish that was specifically prepared just for him. And in this strange prison, Jonah was convinced that God's plan was the right plan for him. Let's join Jonah now as he's on his way to the prison and while he's in the prison and will deal with the truths that he finds there. God will use whatever means are necessary to get our attention, maybe even prison. The fact of the matter is, you can run, but you can't hide from God. So, there are three roads that we're going to talk about here today. The first road that Jonah took was a road I call disobedience. He took the road of disobedience. God had called him for this specific task. He was to go and talk to, or warn, the city of Nineveh, that judgment was coming to them, and it was going to be an ultimate judgment and a final judgment, and he was going to destroy them. God wanted, though, to extend his grace to the people of Nineveh. They were lost and needy, just like everybody else is before they accept the Lord. They were lost and needy. So God wanted to extend a hand to them before it was too late. But Jonah didn't want any part of that. You see, God wanted to save the people of Nineveh, but Jonah hated them. And he couldn't have cared less. They all died. So why did he hate the people of Nineveh so much? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were a fierce, warlike people. They worshipped idols. The Jews did not worship idols. The Ninevites were not Jewish. So Jonah, I wouldn't be surprised if he was a bit of a racist. And the Ninevites were known for the cruelty to the people that they attacked, and they were so brutal, in fact, that whole cities had been known to commit suicide rather than to fall into their hands. See, the Ninevites had focused recently their attention on Israel. It was common knowledge in those days that they were next on the hit list for the Assyrians, and they had, the Assyrians intended to destroy the people of God. So when Jonah hears the call to go and evangelize the city of Nineveh, he makes a quick decision. He goes to Tarshish, or at least he tries. I'll 
Okay, so Tarshish. That's a hard word to say. You know that? I was, I was talking to my wife about it last night. I said, Tarshish, right? Or is it Tarshish? It's either one's hard to say. So I'll just stick with Tarshish, like shish kebab. So, Tarshish was located on the western coast of Spain. It was about 2,000 miles from where he was in the opposite direction. So, it was as far as Jonah could go to get away from God. Jonah seemed to think that he could escape from God's plans in God's sight by running away. And apparently, Jonah held a very small view of God. You see, he thought he was a local God. He was just in the region where he was um, at the time, where he was dwelling. But he still thought he could get away. He still thought he could run far enough away and God couldn't find him. But Jonah holds a faulty theology. Let's turn over to um, Psalm 139. Just got four or three, four verses there. Psalm 139, 7 through 10. And let's just get an idea of what God can see and where he operates. Psalm 139, 7 through 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You see, if we are in heaven or in hell or the uttermost parts of the sea, God is there. Jonah didn't quite have a grasp of that, or if he did, maybe he was just kind of pushing it aside and hoping it wasn't true. Maybe it's one of those things like we try and do our little hidden thing, our little sin in the darkness so nobody sees it, but we fail to realize that God sees everything that we do in our lives. While Jonah has a small view of God, he seems to have a pretty large view of himself. Jonah thinks he's smarter than God. He thinks he's got a better plan. He thinks he can run away and hide from God, and apparently he thinks he can serve God when it's convenient. But when hard times come, and the unpleasant assignment comes, he thinks that he's free to walk away from God and call his life his own. Let's not be too hard on Jonah, though. Don't we think the same way sometimes? Let's be honest. Don't we mind? We don't mind serving the Lord if it's convenient or fits our plan or what we're prepared for or what we think we are um, capable of doing. Sometimes God wants you to do something that you don't think you're capable of doing so that He can show Himself mighty. Sometimes it's not the area of expertise in which you were trained in that God wants you to serve in. Food for thought fun jobs, things like that that you want to do, sometimes that's not what God wants you to do. But when He asks us to do something that we don't want to do, we often rebel and disobey Him. I'm first. You don't have to raise your hands. We may not go to Tarshish, but we do go away from the Lord. Where's your Tarshish? Where do you go when you don't want to do God's will? something to think about. We don't know more than God knows. Simple as that. But we think we're in control of our lives. We think we can call the shots and do as we please, please but let me remind you that when the Lord saved you, when the Lord saved you, when He saved you, He took complete possession of your life. That's, that's tough to swallow. I understand. I'm human. I, I want to run my life. But God owns it. That's our natural flesh fighting against God. But we have to understand, God owns you. He owns your body, your soul, and He alone has the right to tell you what to do. He really does. He can tell you where to go. He can tell you how to live your life. And really, the only way you're going to be happy is if you listen to Him doing that. When He comes along with an assignment for you to fulfill, all He wants to hear from you is okay, I'll do that. Okay, Isaiah 6, 8 said it this way. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And said I, 
your life. Anything less, in God's eyes, is disobedience and rebellion. And that attitude will not go unchallenged by the Lord. I've heard, uh, and I've even said this myself, the times that I've run from the Lord, and I use them as illustrations and how God has finally gotten a hold of me and everything. You know something? That's nothing to be proud of. It's not a badge of honor to run from God. It's by His grace that we stop running and that we turn around and that we come back and serve Him. It's not a badge of honor to say you refused to do what the Lord told you to do. Has God been speaking to your heart about something He wants you to do? Are you obeying His voice? Or are you doing as you please, going on your way and going against God's will? Not anybody else's will. You know God's will for your life. It's between you and God. You see, it all started out for Jonah on the road of disobedience. Then he came to a fork in the road. He said, I think I'll take a right here and go down the road of disappointments. Because that's where the road of disobedience ultimately will lead you. When Jonah hits the road, things go well at first. He thinks he's got his plan all together. He finds a ship going to the right place, basically as far away as he can get from God, so he thinks. He was able to pay the fare, board the ship, and lay down for a little bit of rest. And he thinks that he's going to have a smooth cruise, and they start off, and he's going to have a new life in this new location. Jonah has it all planned out, and then the disappointments begin immediately. They get out to sea. First off, Jonah had to pay his own expenses. I know it's a trivial point, but when God calls you to do something, he pays your fare. He takes care of you. He equips you. He will give you what you need. But next, in verses 6 through 10 of our text, did you notice that the captain and the crew were on to Jonah pretty quick? They knew who he was and what he was about. They knew the condition of his heart and his life. They weren't even saved. They, were, they had all kinds of different gods. Because it said when the storm started, they were praying to all these different gods. Anybody that works. That's what I'm going to pray for. Anybody that works. So they're out there, and they've got him pegged. They know who he is. Now, if Jonah's heart had been right with the Lord, he would not have lost his witness and damaged his testimony before these pagan sailors, really. Did you also notice that Jonah, in the end, 15 through 17, ended up in a place that he never dreamed he would end up? People just don't end up where Jonah ended up and, and speak about it. And yet he did. You see, nothing worked out like Jonah had planned it. The same scenario will play, it, play itself out in our lives and the lives of all who choose their own path over God's path. They will experience trials, tribulations, disappointments, hardships that could have been avoided. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs 13, 15 that the way of transgressors is hard. When you're not in God's will, you know what you're doing? You're transgressing. Your way is going to be hard. That's a lesson to learn young. I'm here to tell you. Because if you're not doing God's will, it's going to be hard. Nothing's going to be easy. I'm not saying that if you're in God's will, you're not going to have trials and difficulties and temptations, but I'm going to tell you that when you do and you're in His will, He'll take care of you all the way because He is all-sufficient. He will carry you each step of the way and give you just enough for each day to carry on. Those trials will seem small someday, too. When we finally see what the end result is, we get to heaven. Galatians 6, 7-9 through 9 kind of puts it in another light. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And that's a great promise. Yeah, it's going to get tough sometimes. But let's not be weary in well-doing. Well-doing means doing what God wants you to do. If it's well, that means God's saying, that's the thing I want you to be doing. So don't be weary in doing what God wants you to do. 
Because it tells us right here, in due season, we will reap if we faint not. Sometimes it's really scary and the giant is standing right in front of you and yeah, you want to faint. But you know what? When you're standing with God, He will supply all your need and He's not going to let you down. And you'll soon find, as you step that first step, that giant disintegrate and disappear. And you realize, oh, God's got this all under control. If the Lord has been calling you to a certain path and you choose to go in another direction, don't be surprised when the troubles and disappointments start to come your way. Because not only does the road of disappointment, or sorry, dis disobedience lead to the road of disappointment, it ends up on the road of disaster. That's the final end of your disappointments. Jonah made his decision and set his plan in motion. He, sh he set out for Tarshish. His goal was to flee from the presence of the Lord. Did you notice, though, the first word in verse 4? Look back and uh, let's read verses 3 and then the very beginning of verse 4. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea that, so that the ship was like to be broken. Jonah had his plan, but God had the final say. God first sent the storm to get Jonah's attention. Didn't work out too well at first because he was sound asleep and the, the captain of the ship had to go wake him up. But it must have been a pretty terrible storm because the sailors were pretty scared. They thought they were done for. They had weathered other storms in the Mediterranean, but they had never seen one quite as ferocious as this one. Jonah was fast asleep, but he was soon awoken. And the sailors concluded that God was behind the storm, and so they cast lots to see whose fault it was, basically, and they picked Jonah. They picked good old Jonah. He's forced to confess all of his rebellion in front of a bunch of lost sinners who don't believe in God or don't know the Lord as their Savior. Basically, getting caught out in your sin in front of a bunch of lost people. Isn't that, a, isn't that a horrible way to be as a Christian when you think about it? It's like you go to court for something as a believer. You say, but I'm a Christian. It's like, it doesn't help you. He's still going to pay for the, whatever it is you did, and you're going to confess it in front of the whole world. It's not a good place for you to be, and it's a terrible place for your testimony to be if you're living in this world and trying to make a difference for the Lord. He's forced to confess to them. So then Jonah suggests, well, you know, why don't you guys throw me overboard? That's probably best for all concerned. Let's just get this over with and we'll be done with it. And it's not the first time in this book that Jonah talks about ending his own life. Jonah suggests they throw him overboard because he is the cause. But the sailors even have more compassion on him than he has because they want to try and save him. So they're trying to save the ship and him, but they're fighting a losing battle because the storm was just too great for them. When they throw him over, finally, the storm ends. The storm is complete. It's finished. It's calm again. And then the sailors come to a realization of just how powerful God is. And I wonder how many of them got converted that day. Kind of talks to the idea of revival. When you get backsliders out of your midst, revival can take place. Whether it be just physically leaving, or whether it be the backslider gets their heart right. Whatever the case, revival can come if the backslider is removed from a revival situation. Something to think about. Then Jonah finds himself swallowed alive by a fish just prepared for him. Only for him. You know, there's a lot of uh, conjecture. You know, I, I've tried to find examples of you know, people living through being swallowed by a, a whale or a fish or something like that. There are some accounts out there, actually, but there are a lot of skeptics. A lot of people talk about 
oh yeah, you know, there's no way a guy can get swallowed up by anything and live underwater for three days and come back and be alive. Well, first off, I really don't care too much about the worldly examples. Some people need them. I'm good with my faith. And miracles are God doing things that nobody else can do. So I understand this. And God prepared the fish. I mean, if God prepared the fish, it's going to work. There's, there's not going to be any problem there. But for the naysayers, okay, I'm going to give you an example here. In 1891, off the coast of the Falkland Islands, a man on a whaling vessel named James Bartlett fell overboard. He was swallowed by, by what looked like a giant fish, and uh, he was living to tell the tale. They claim that it was an absolute impossibility, but nonetheless, he bobbed in the ocean, and he got swallowed up. After a day and a half, the crew of the boat caught a large whale. And when they began to process and disembowel the animal, they saw that there was some spasmodic kind of movement in the whale's stomach. They cut it open. It was James Bartlett. He wasn't in real good shape. His skin was bleached white, and his hair was eaten off by the gastric juices of the whale. And he was unconscious, but he was alive. He was alive. They were able to revive him, and they were able to talk to him of his experience. And yes, he did live. He did end up there. The, the guy I was reading, I read this big long thesis that a guy had written about it. They actually, um, he found some hospital records in London where they had taken this guy after this event, and he had you know, some real skin problems. And so they had to you know, put special stuff on him and everything. And I don't know that. I think he actually recovered eventually, but uh, he never did recover his color. He was always white, white after that, uh, just because he'd been bleached. Um, but he was revived, and he was able to talk about his experiences. And what happened to that whaler is a little bit of worldly proof, scientific proof, if you will, of what the Bible says is accurate. Again, I believe in miracles that God performs. So I don't need this, but it's sometimes nice for people when you witness to them, you can show them something like this. One thing after another went wrong until Jonah found himself in a place of utter helplessness. But God knows how to bring people to their knees when he needs to. And Jonah needed something extreme. And he knows how to take, let's see if I can word this correctly, he knows how to take the butt out of you. Regardless of what he wants you to do, simply do it. If you rebel, you'll find that your pathway will be filled with disappointments and disasters. I know this is not a happy lesson, but it's something we all need to get a hold of. He will not let you get away. He will pursue you, and he will do whatever it takes to get you in a place of absolute submission. Is God trying to get you to do something? Is God trying to get you to do something? Is He calling you to do maybe a new ministry, to a deeper walk with Him, to a new kind of work? If He is, my advice to you is don't run from Him. You know, because honestly, it's not about control. It's about love. I would be remiss if I didn't say that. God does not want to love you and force you into a mold. He wants you to be willing and love Him because He loves you so much. He's preparing you, not for this world, He's preparing you for heaven. This is a big training ground down here. We're learning to be more and more Christ-like every day. And one day we'll look back at our trials and they won't seem so small. They will be insignificant in reflection when we're looking back at them. My advice is to you, run to Him and not from Him. Yield to his will. He won't change his mind. He'll continue to work on you. Unless just like a loving parent who work on a disobedient child, they're not going to turn their back on them. They're going to continue to work with them until they learn exactly what they're supposed to learn. A father had a rather strong-willed child. On the way to the store, he kept telling him, sit down and buckle your seatbelt. You ever done that? or get in the car seat, you know, the real little ones. 
Yeah, I'm getting some smiles. I, I, I know, I was there. But the little kid kept standing in the seat. And again, Dad told him, sit down and buckle your seatbelt. After two, two, three more times, the little boy was convinced, okay, now I've taken him to his limit. Kids always know where that limit is, too. Okay, Dad's about to snap. It's going to get ugly. So now I will hook my seatbelt. Okay, so he slipped down into the seat, snapped the seatbelt in, and he said, Daddy, I think some of you probably never thought of this. I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Has God been calling you to do something for His glory? Have you been taking a different path than His? Wouldn't today be a great day? Let's just keep on. Quit fighting. Come to Him. Tell Him you're through running and fighting and you're ready to go with Him. If you've spoken to your heart, it's a simple request, recommit yourself to Him. If you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior, Please accept him as, as he wants you to, as he wants to be your father. He wants to guide you through his life. He wants to love you. He wants to give you purpose in your life. We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. And if I know this hasn't necessarily been a salvation message, but if God has spoken to your heart and you need to accept him as Lord and Savior, I just ask that you would come down front. And the music starts to play when we have our invitation. And there will be someone here that can talk to you and show you in the Bible how that you might be saved. Let's bow our heads close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you now for this time together. Thank you for this message. Thank you for how it's worked in my life, worked in my heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would have your will and way during this invitation time that people might decide that it's not worth running and being brought low when they could enjoy being an obedient son or daughter of yours. They can enjoy the many blessings and not the chastisement. So, Father, we just give this time to you now, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Again, bow your heads, close your eyes, and we'll just have a time where the Lord has spoken to your heart and you'd like to respond. You can come forward. You can kneel right down here and pray. If you need to, you can pray in your seats. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come. Whatever your need, the altar is open for you.
Amen. Amen. You can look up this way. If you've been blessed this morning, let's hear a loud amen. 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 I know. It was a tough message. It was, it was one of those messages that was not real happy. But it was something I believe is necessary for all of us. And um, you can't hide from God, but um, it's not really worth hiding from God. God is so benevolent. God loves us so much. And His will is so much better than what you would have if you run from Him. But I'm not going to get started yet. We have some coffee and tea and biscuits. If you want to hang around a little bit, fellowship right afterwards. Love to have you. There's no rush. You don't have to run off right away. And uh, please be back uh, this evening for uh, the 6.30 service. Brother Arnold will be bringing the message tonight. And also, uh, again, at 5.30, we're going to have a meeting of all the members. If you can possibly make it, please come. And uh, we will see you then. All right, Brother Marcus, if I could get you to close this out, please, in a word of prayer, then we'll be dismissed for this morning.